So welcome everybody. My name is Mikhail Larsen. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer. And today I'm going to be joined by a group of experts here to discuss the business case for nature-based solutions. You'll probably be hard pressed to have opened a newsletter or a, a, a news anywhere and not having heard anything around the two big crises that are facing us, climate change and biodiversity loss. And while the implication of climate change has been pretty well advertised, perhaps it is less obvious what the loss of biodiversity or the loss of nature really means. Recent studies suggest that we've already wiped out 80% of wild animals around the world. And I just read recently that only 5% of nature is completely untouched by human hands. And when you start to think about the implication of that, about 50% of the world's economy is somehow dependent on nature. That's an amazing $44 trillion, and it's really hard to grasp numbers like that, but you start to think about it, everything we consume, whether it's the food that we eat, or the car that you drive, or the home that we're living, everything somehow has to start in nature. So what are nature-based solutions? Well, far, far, rather than being something abstract, they're real solutions, and as we're going to show you today, they can't be investable. So there are things like restoring and taking care of nature. There are things like reforesting. There are things like preserving mangroves around Asia. And there are also things about bringing nature into cities. So today what we're going to do as a group here is we're going to start off with talking about the business case. Then we're going to look at some of the roadblocks that investing into nature-based solutions are facing. Then we're going to look at some of the pilot studies that we conducted using technology to solve some of the problem. And then we're going to end up with a call to action. And with me, I'm very fortunate to be surrounded by four people here who are all experts in their own field. So starting with Maura, who is the director uh, of the CTO office at Google. And we have Fred, who is the director at Temasek. Um, he has as a full-time job to essentially know all the emerging technology, and I have yet to know of a single technology that he doesn't have a view on. Very impressive. Then next to me here is Professor Ko. Professor Ko is the director of the Faculty of Nature-Based Solution at NUS here in Singapore. And he is one of the world's leading researchers in the area of nature-based solutions. Um, he's been featured in more articles in more of the leading uh, news places than I could probably mention in the next 40 minutes. I won't even try. And then to my right-hand side here, I have our very own DBS uh, Chief Innovation Officer, Bidwit Dumra, who has a view on everything in technology uh, and has a deep passion for nature. So why don't we just get started now? And maybe I can turn to you, Fred, sure. and, and ask you the question. So tell me, what is really the business case for nature-based solution? Well, I think it is important to perhaps start by looking at what are the central challenges that we would be facing as a community. Mm -hmm. Because businesses are, at the start, a part of the community, right? They're an important stakeholder. And as you have mentioned, climate change, biodiversity loss, global warming, these are all major challenges that all of us face. And looking at the issue around climate change, we realize that what is leading to climate change, a lot of it is global warming. And what is causing global warming is the rising levels of carbon in our uh, environment. And so decarbonization becomes a central issue that all of us need to confront. In the first instance, I think companies would need, then need to think about how do I decarbonize right? my activities, uh, my supply chain, uh, many of the things that I'm doing in order to positively contribute to this central challenge that we are all facing. At the start, we can think about near-term mitigation opportunities. Is there a way that I can offset? Is there a way that I can do simple things that can help me be a bit more resource efficient? What are the top of mind things that companies will be concerned about? Clearly, they will be concerned about cost. There is no company here today that is going to say, look, if this is going to ruin my business, I will still do it anyway because then there, I cease to exist and there is, that's the end of the game, right? Um, the second thing that they will also be thinking about really would be the time dimension. When do I need to do it by? Yeah. So what is the sense of urgency? Um, when do I need to transform? And of course, then they start to do a little bit of a, 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 a trade-off, perhaps, between how fast do I need to do this versus how much it's going to cost me. And then the third thing, of course, is also, is it feasible and is it technically possible, right? So something that is easy to implement, um, it is cheap, 
it can be done now, uh, it becomes a no-brainer that companies would embrace. So that leads us to thinking about within the range of solutions that's possible for companies to decarbonize, what can I possibly think of today? And one of the lower cost uh, solutions that we have in order to help companies to offset and decarbonize would be, as you say, um, nature-based solutions. It's a relatively untapped area of solutions and opportunities, but it also has the promise of offering fairly low cost solutions to companies who think about offsetting their carbon footprint. I also think that it is important for us to think about a portfolio approach to this. So in other words, it's not just that everything ought to be nature-based solutions, but certainly companies need to be a lot more familiar with what it means. How can I assess this opportunity and think about nature-based solutions as part of a portfolio of different solutions that people can uh, adopt right, in order to decarbonize? Um, now, are there challenges? Clearly there are, uh, because today the science in some of these areas may not be as developed. Um, we don't, for example, uh, are not able to specifically quantify for, say, one hectare of mangrove, for example, especially in the blue carbon space, right? And I'm sure Prof. Cole will be able to talk about it a little bit more later. But if we are not able to be more granular around what one hectare of mangrove can do for me and different species of mangroves in different kinds of ecosystems, then it is very hard for us to be able to price that accurately and know exactly what am I offsetting, how much am I offsetting, and is it sufficient? Is 10 hectares sufficient? Is 20 hectares sufficient? Mm -hmm. Now, the promise of this is great because some initial uh, analysis suggests that maybe um, you know, nature-based solutions, in particular some blue carbon solutions, uh, could perhaps offer anywhere between 50 to 100 times more uh, carbon sequestration potential than green carbon. But is that actually true? Can we actually verify that? Can we actually prove that? Right? And then after that, translate that into a, a product that we can actually put out to the market. So these are the things where I, I believe that if with better science, better information, we would be able to um, uh, get this a lot more proliferated and have a lot more people think about nature-based solutions as part of their portfolio of solutions to address the carbon challenge. That's very interesting. Maybe I could just follow up with a question. Where do you see some of the things that really must be resolved to make sure that people have faith in nature-based solutions? So if we think about... Um, carbon credits and nature-based solutions really as a continuum along a supply chain, right, or a value mm. chain. Then right up at the start, I think we need to start with the science. And on the science, I think that there are two, two aspects to it. The first part of it is really to just understand on a per hectare basis or on a per square meter, or on a per tree basis, for example, what actually is the carbon sequestration potential? And on this, I think there are two elements to this. One is the full storage potential, yep. and second, the rate of sequestration. Because let's just assume that, oh, one hectare can store one gigatons, let's just say, right? But it does so very, very slowly. But we have a time urgency, right? So the question is, if it takes forever to sequester, even if the storage potential is tremendous, um, it is also not quite relevant. Mm. No. So that on the first part of it, we're going to get science right. The second part of it is that, do we actually have the full uh, verification capabilities to make sure that we are able to get people to trust that number? Right. Uh, and trust that number over time. Because uh, nature-based solutions takes time, right? Just like plants need to grow, we need to give it time. And we also need to ensure that there is some permanence to this solution because it, doesn't it will not help us if, for example, at the start, we conserve X hectares of, uh, of uh, mangrove. And then after a few years, because of neglect or inability to continue to verify, we don't know whether it continues to deliver that kind of carbon sequestration. So the verification capability is important. And we need to think of um, perhaps low cost effective, robust ways to do that verification. Because what it will not do is for us to have a very low-cost solution in nature base, but very high-cost overheads to maintain that. Understood. Right. And the third part around high quality really is also um, understanding whether there are uh, perhaps co-benefits uh, to nature-based solutions. And can that actually be proven? Like for example, we know that if we are able to improve uh, coastal protection through our mangroves, that it also improves the water quality and the biodiversity in our coastal areas, which could have uh, knock-on benefits, say, for the fisheries industry uh, in that area, right? Or ecotourism and things like that. So um, those things can then add to the quality of our products, but that has got to be shown, it's got to be demonstrated, and more importantly, we have got to think long-term because carbon projects are going to be long-term by its very nature. So if I break it down, as I understand what you're saying, Fred, is there's essentially two things. We need to have trust in the amount of carbon that is sequestered or captured by nature. 
And two, we need to have trust in the way that we verify it. So maybe if we break it down into that, then I could turn to Professor Ko for the first part of it, and then maybe I could turn to Amora and Bidu it for the second part of it. So Professor Ko, I know you've done a lot of research in this area here, and I know that yesterday a, a report was, an, was uh, launched that, that Tomasic and DBS was also involved in. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the issues around actually figuring out the, the sequestration of carbon in nature-based solutions. Yeah, so, so I think uh, in, in addition to, to what uh, Fred just mentioned, uh, the science can also help us uh, understand the, the scale of the, the solution uh, with, with respect to the scale of the problem. Right? Um, so, for example, we know that roughly on a global scale, uh, we, are, we are looking at uh, carbon emissions of about 40 billion tons per year. Well, recent research has, has suggested that nature-based solutions can contribute up to maybe about 10 to 20, 25 billion tons of climate mitigation potential per year. That's from the whole suite of nature-based solutions. From our perspective as, as conservation uh, scientists, we are, I think, Within the universe of nature-based solutions, our top priority is to understand the potential that protection, the protecting nature, uh, protecting forests or mangroves or nat nat other natural ecosystems, how that uh, can contribute to climate mitigation. Mm. Because from our perspective, um, it, 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 it doesn't make sense to, to grow new forests if we cannot hold on to what we have, right. because the new ones will be lost uh, eventually if we don't create the uh, conditions to protect the, 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 the forest that we have, right? So what, one of the first pieces of research that uh, NUS has invested in is to understand the scale of the solution in terms of protecting tropical forests uh, around the world. And our preliminary findings uh, suggest that um, forest protection can contribute up to about um, 2 billion tons of climate mitigation potential uh, per year. It's quite significant. I think that already can help. And also, given the you know, immense interest in blue carbon, as, as Fred mentioned, we also um, did some very preliminary uh, analysis on uh, what, what, what the picture looks like just for blue carbon. The blue carbon is, is always a little bit challenging because of the lack of information, lack of data, science data. But we still uh, you know, make use of the best available data and we looked into it. And to, to our surprise, somewhat our surprise, we found that a blue carbon, a protection of blue carbon, contributes to quite a small uh, fraction of, of the, uh, the climate mitigation potential offered by uh, uh, forest protection as, as a whole. In fact, uh, protecting blue carbon uh, may only give us, may only generate about 0 0.03 billion tons of, of uh, carbon equivalent in terms of climate mitigation potential globally. And are there any particular reasons why we would want to protect them rather than anything else? I mean, the, 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 the ability to capture carbon, mm. to keep it in layman's terms, is one thing. But are there other benefits to, to blue carbon solutions over forests, which seems to be the flavor of the day for many people? Right, right. So, of course, uh, and as Fred also mentioned earlier, um, protecting or restoring these natural ecosystems, whether it's green carbon, terrestrial forests, or blue carbon, coastal ecosystems, is not just for climate mitigation. Right. It's also for the, the, the ability to deliver a, a multitude, you know, multiple co-benefits for society, including you know, maintaining livelihoods, uh, maintaining uh, the fisheries, uh, providing and filtering our, our clean, uh, pro ensuring that we continue to get clean air and water uh, from the uh, filtering or, or water regulation services that these ecosystems provide. So, so th th there are a lot of other reasons that we should be uh, protecting and restoring these natural ecosystems. Actually, I would add a point. Um, one of the things that we are uh, worried about, obviously, right, is about this issue around additionality and permanence of some of our credit projects. And uh, I think one of the things that led us to, to consider blue carbon a little bit more seriously is the fact that actually when it comes to land use pressures, now green, green carbon uh, projects, right, because they are forest and land based, are typically going to be under a little bit more pressure from development, urban development and things like that, or as people want to exploit on land. If we are talking about uh, maritime-based types of solutions, 
because they are a little bit further out from our natural habitat as human beings, um, they may come under slightly less pressure. Not that they will not come under pressure, but slightly less pressure. And therefore, from a permanent uh, competing land use perspective, they may just be that tad more attractive. So what I want to do now is I just want to hear uh, you. You had you done some 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 research. I, I I know about which area of the world could be potential high uh, interest for investment. Right. Are you able to share a little bit about the research that you've done? And are, are there particular areas here in, in Asia where you see there's really an opportunities for investment in either blue or green carbon solutions? Yeah, for sure. Um, so um, part of the in in the research that that uh, that NUS has, has uh, been focused on over the last couple of months, we are also able to uh, map out, uh, basically create a wall to wall map of where these uh, investable uh, forest carbon projects might lie, physically or geographically, and we find that uh, most of the investable forest carbon, and by that by investable forest carbon, I mean uh, forests containing large amounts of carbon and at the same time under threat of loss by various drivers, you know, deforestation, illegal logging, development projects and so on, and whereby an intervention uh, would be able to help prevent that loss. And this is the, the, the idea of additionality that Fred mentioned earlier. So we find that uh, the vast majority of investable forest carbon projects are in fact found in uh, uh, some parts of uh, uh, Central and South America and uh, Asia, especially Southeast Asia. But further than that, we also uh, wanted to understand not just where investable projects are, but where these investable projects would be most profitable or most financially viable. Because a project could be investable, but they may not be financially viable right. because of various you know, costs and operating expenses and, and so on, a lot of factors. So we took it a step further. We also created a map of uh, basically a return on investment of investing in forest carbon projects around the world. And we find that uh, the most profitable region geographically is, is actually Southeast Asia. It's our part of the world. So that's, that's really exciting and, and somewhat surprising as well. Um, and then that's that's why I think everybody is so so keen to uh, to understand more about uh, how how we could potentially capitalize uh, on these opportunities. Right. That's very good because that's the segue into the second part of the conversation. So as I said earlier, there are many. There's essentially two parts to making sure that we have nature-based solutions, carbon credit that we can trust. One is the trust that when we say. Uh, by the biomass sequester something, it is like that. And Professor Koh has been speaking to some of the work that he's been doing. The second bit is that we can actually trust that when we say that trees have grown or mangroves have been preserved, that that is actually the case. And for the, in these 40 minutes that we have today, we will not be able to get into all the details of, of permanence and additionality, but we can talk about some of the flaws that exist in today's method and where technology can come in. And maybe what I can do now is I can turn to, to my two other guests here, uh, Bidwit and Mora, and, and maybe I can start with you, Bidwit, and tell me. So tell me a little bit about what it is we do today to try and verify that the trees are st still standing, and what are some of the things that might be able to improve, and what's some of the work that we have done? And then I can hand it over to, to Mora and tell us a little bit about the potential of technology in this space here. What's happening now? We, it's not a blank piece of paper. I mean, there's some amazing work that's already happening. You've got some, uh, you've got standards and methodologies that are already in place. And these talk to how you can currently go and verify. But a lot of these uh, standards and methodologies are very reliant on manual processes. So for example, you've got uh, a plantation or project that has, let's say 100,000 trees or X amount of hectares of land. You engage with an audit body or verification body that will come. They will come onto site. They will sample certain areas. And then against that, they will basically run a model and say, against your project, X amount of carbon has been sequestered. So that's the, the current mechanism. But inherently, we all know humans, we are the weakest link. So there are invariably errors that show up. So we looked at a couple of projects, and we found when we were looking through the verification documents, now these verification documents are about 500 pages thick, 
They are countless documents. So when we start to look at some of these, uh, we found that some of the coordinates they had put, when we went and looked at the coordinates, they were in the middle of the ocean. Intent is there, but humans inherently, <clears throat> we create inefficiencies. I mean, I know even my handwriting is so bloody bad. If I went and I was an auditor, I, I would be the cause of a lot of these problems. So nevertheless, we said, OK, what is it that we can do? Because there's a short term and then there's longer term. The longer term is definitely we need to look at better science. But we said, OK, if this is the current as is, how can we add one layer on top? So we, we did a couple of POCs. The first is we looked at saying, if these documents are so rich, but again, so laborious, I mean, 500 pages times X per project, we created an AI tool that basically has the ability to ingest all these documents. So a number of documents against a project, it can pass through it, pull out all the relevant data that is very specific to measuring carbon, at the ecological, but also looking at how they have tackled the audit for the core benefits. Because a lot of the projects do do that. I mean, all these nature-based projects are very multidimensional, as they all have talked about. We've seen where they've gone in, they want to grow trees, but to grow trees, they need to engage the local communities. It gives them jobs. They need to educate them on how to look and preserve the trees, new mechanisms of growing. Uh, they end up also having to put fire protection. They look at wildlife preservation. They also end up creating schools for the local community so the kids have alternate sources of income so they don't go and log back the trees. So that adds to sustainability. So all these different dimensions. So the auditors will go and rate all of these and they're all hidden over there. So the AI tool has the ability to pull all that information out and basically allow you to create in a, in a readable and accessible format. So that was the first beast we said. How do we create more transparency, remove some of the ambiguity? That will then allow us to compare using remote sensing technology. So then we started a second POC looking at satellite-based verification at using LiDAR, and uh, we said, is there a mechanism for us to create some level of integrity onto carbon measurements without physically having to go on site? We came across a couple of people who have done work in the space. They have taken years of data, put it onto a model, and we will basically then be able to say that based on historic data, could you point a satellite to a project and come up with a carbon model or a carbon sequestration? And we were then able to compare it with the manual process. And it was able to quickly identify where there were discrepancies, like say for errors where people have gone and done it in wrong places. But it was also able to look at cause and impact, where in certain instances, a project, they had done an extrapolation against a sample, but the real satellite data showed pockets where the reality was completely different. And why the satellite it was also able to go historic and say why that discrepancy is there. There was a forest fire that happened at X time, but because the auditors came in a window between two to three years, they didn't essentially build that into their model. So we found that there was a, an additional layer of integrity that we were able to bring that we could layer on top of the existing methodologies. So we said, okay, so we can add to existing methodologies, but also that, to your point, it said, could there be a completely better way to do it? So we started delving into these POCs to understand where the remote sensing technologies are a support, or could they eventually become the primary where ground truthing is the support? So can you flip the dimension? So ground truthing people, people on the ground. Yeah, but ground truthing, but they'll come in and they'll basically do the measurements, et cetera. So we looked at saying is, could there be this flip? And if the flip happens, then the technology is accessible. It's cheaper. Maybe it could be much more accurate. That would allow more supply to come in, more verification methodologies to be introduced, more science to be added onto the technology that could bring a heightened sense of trust into these projects and into the outcomes. So that's the approach we started looking at. Yes. Okay, I want to turn to our last guest now. 
Um, and more, I know that Google has been doing amazing things with technologies like that. Personally, I've been very impressed with what you've been doing with fishing fleets and satellite technology following uh, fishing fleets around the world and making sure that if they go through an area, they don't fish if they're not allowed to. Truly amazing work. I know that Google has a really large sustainability program as well. Why do you see this as an area that Google can really make a difference in? And tell me also a little bit about how Google thinks about sustainability and investment cases for sustainability. Sure. So, um, having an opportunity to work on nature free solution, I think it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, thank you for inviting me. Um, so, look, we, we spent, what, uh, two, 200 years or so since the Industrial Revolution, you know, making and perfecting machines, right? Um, all for our own benefit. So we, we just, you know, just, just wanted things easier. Uh, but we didn't realize that that would come at a very, very expensive, massive cost, right, to, to our environment. So isn't it time for the machines to pay back? You know, and I think it's a little bit of the way we think. We think that, you know, um, now the technology has reached to a point where there's no excuse for us not to use it to make, to make this happen, right? So, um, look, you know, like what, what uh, Bidio said earlier, um, we have now satellite images with such amount of precision that we can just expand any, any area of interest uh, and just find, you know, an incredible amount of useful data that not just now, but, you know, that spans back in time. Um, and uh, when you put on top, of the, on top of those maps, you can put also data of previous research, like you know, scientific research from all over the, the globe. So you have petabytes uh, and petabytes of, of data uh, that is publicly available and that we can just lay on top of, this, of these maps. Um, uh, then you know, imagine now putting sensory, you know, um, sensors that provide a feed of data in real time. And that gives us like what, 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 is, uh, what happened in the past and what is happening now. But not only that, so now we can also look at what's going to happen in the future, right? Uh, and that's something that, you know, it, it's a, it was a dream before, right? So we, uh, now we can use, like, the largest computational power in the planet, basically. You know, we, you know, Google have this incredible amount of infrastructure. So we can put all of those infrastructure to actually, uh, you know, crunch the numbers for us, right? And then we can create this artificial intelligence models that will not only tell us what happened in the past and now, but also can start predicting what's going to happen in the future, start giving us insight of where we can, where we can focus and, and, and what are the things, what are the impact of like, our activities, right? Um, so when you put all that together um, and then you have all of this um, readily available infrastructure across the planet that allow us to collaborate, just so any data that I find out, I can make it public and I can use your data publicly. And then when we can put all this together, uh, uh, then, we, then we realize that there's no excuse not to do it, you know? Um, and um, I think nature-based solutions, as, as we said earlier, it's, uh, it's, it's not just about, um, it's, not, it's not only about like, you know, doing the right thing, but also at the same time, uh, there, there are many economic benefits as do, of doing so too. So if we, like if we restore mangroves in somewhere, or we restore a, a, a marine ecosystem, then you can attract tourism, uh, and then you can develop uh, some areas. So it's a very, very important area that I think technology has, has been a little bit uh, shifted most, most, mostly towards um, uh, reducing emission, but now I think it's time to, to think about how do we restore, how do we, how do we conserve it, and like, like, like you were mentioning, uh, one thing I wanted to add that's why it's better to uh, preserve it first is because preservation, it's, uh, you know, we are preserving ecosystems that took millions of years to evolve to where they are uh, versus us trying to mimic it and trying to do it is much harder and never as efficient as nature has done it, right? So, so what better to use those machines that were perfected for so long to actually look at it and, and try to preserve, preserve and, you know, and restore uh, that, that ecosystem. I think that's the way we look at it. Ten years ago, this was a dream. Uh, now, you know, Google has been, like you mentioned, you know, heavily involved with multiple organizations uh, doing this kind of work. And I can show you a little video that shows a, a lot of the efforts that has been done using this technology. All over the world, oceans are in trouble. Deforestation. Amazon loss. Mangrove loss. Melting glaciers. Fires are getting more intense. 
Traditional West African pastoralist lifestyles are being affected. There are communities who are struggling to survive. There's so much going on in the world, but there are so many people wanting to make a difference, so many people enthusiastic about what they do. We are using Google Earth to monitor the forest and the illegal activity in Indonesia. To make remote sensing more equitable and inclusive for everyone. To create virtual tours of sites related to slavery. To bring attention to the health disparities that have affected these marginalized communities during the pandemic. Provide training, tools, and technology that supports indigenous self-determination and environmental stewardship. To create immersive, interactive content to improve quality of education in public schools. We are monitoring community wells for pH, turbidity, and coliform. We are tracking human impacts on global mangrove ecosystems. To generate deforestation alerts monthly in the Brazilian Amazon region. We're using Google Earth Engine to show people where and when to expect the biggest impacts from sea level rise. To estimate the pollution levels in different parts of the country. To take the world virtual diving. The Earth Engine plays an important role to mitigate climate change. We can tell the changes chronologically. And by making a single picture, we are telling the public, here is the area that the problem might occur in the future. Fires are having a massive impact on this area. The satellite imagery we source from Google Earth, Google Earth Engine, has really enabled people to extract information that they would never have accessible before. And that really helps us pinpoint where we need to look at on the ground. What we've heard from our experts now is really that trust is a critical thing in terms of getting people to invest into nature-based solution. And what we've explained through these last 40 minutes is really that we've, we've been able to show that technology has a role to play in terms of making sure that people believe that when we say the forest is standing, it exists. And science, as we heard from Professor Coe, has a critical role to play to make sure that we actually believe that the carbon credits are generated and the carbon is actually captured by nature-based solutions. In reality, is nobody's seen what a ton of carbon looks like, so it is one of these things where you have to build the trust. But we also heard anybody who read the media still says that ah, this is a difficult area. So when we talk about the business case, maybe I can ask you first, Bidwit, what would be your argument? Why should an investor consider a nature-based solution argument, uh, investment as a, different from somebody else? Are they giving up return? Or can this actually be a viable investment product? And why should they invest? So I'll, so I'll speak on the back of the work we've done with looking and talking to these 70 plus organizations. And when we, uh, when we look from innovation, we ask ourselves four questions. Uh, from a desirable perspective, is, is there desirability? We look at viability, feasibility, and the last is responsibility. Is it the right thing to do? And when you look at the fact that we only have this one planet right now for us to live in, and this one planet is the only one that we have to make sure that is preserved from a nature-based, and, and this is, I'm going to go back to what Mauro was saying, there they has been such precision in balancing life that we have been responsible for imbalancing. So it is only upon us to rebalance it. And with nature-based solutions, it is the opportunity that we have to get back in the game and help Mother Nature out as Mother Nature has been helping us all along. And then maybe I can turn to you, Fred, because it's all good and fine that we want to save the world. I certainly want to as well. But I know that Tomasic has been thinking about this area also in, for a long time in terms of an investment opportunity. Can you ask it, is it actually viable to invest in these things? Am I going to be losing money if I invest into trees and mangroves? I think we need to think of it a little bit more holistically mm. in terms of how businesses and companies can actually access this opportunity. Mm. Now, not all of us would be in a position to be able to invest and develop such projects. Right. Uh, at it is right now, there, are, there is a need to have some of the project developers, some of the consultants come alongside. You've got to think about financing. You may be working across different jurisdictions. So there are certain complications with how you want to go do this, and it's not for everybody. But I guess every one of us can think about wanting to buy credits from nature-based solutions, right? So even if you can't invest, you can't develop, 
you certainly can create the kind of demand for it. And if more of us are able to create the demand for it, then I think a market can then be created. And what that does is that um, I don't think we are thinking about nature-based solutions as the be-all, end-all for how we abate carbon in all our different sectors, right? There will be times where some of us will need to find solutions that are within our value chain. That means directly impacting our industry as opposed to, say, uh, protecting a forest uh, somewhere else uh, a little bit further away from our operations. But that said, I think if we take a portfolio approach to this and say that perhaps we should be a lot more open to having nature-based solutions as part of the entire solution set that our companies are looking at in terms of abating our carbon, I think that that will be important. But even going beyond an investor developer, going beyond individual companies wanting credits, I think if we look around us, it is also possible to think of nature-based solutions as not just something that is going to be in some faraway forest or in some coastal region in, in a faraway country. If we look at the city that we're in right now, Singapore, right, we have always looked, oursel- looked at ourselves as a garden city, but more recently, as a city in a garden. What that basically means is that we need to understand that our urban landscape is really just imprinted on nature, right? We, are, we, are, we have to operate within what nature is. And if we look at Singapore, what we are struck by when visitors come to Singapore is really about how green we are, the fact that we are actually able to introduce nature solutions within our urban planning, right? So we do not need to think of nature-based solution as some isolated, specific class of solutions. It really is something that we ought to be integrating into the way that we operate, the way that we live. And the moment that we are able to do that, I mean, like if you take uh, like um, this... Uh, Uh, some of our buildings where there is a lot of greenery on it, there could be multiple times the amount of uh, nature solutions on that vertical building as it would be otherwise if it's just one square piece of land, right? So the moment that we're able to think more innovatively around how we integrate, and and, and that's the thought that I will leave uh, the audience uh, with, is that if we are able to think about how to integrate nature-based solutions into our everyday operations, then I think we would have achieved this level of uh, looking at nature solutions as part of our overall strategy to decarbonize. That's a wonderful way of thinking about it. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to address this to all of you all because this is a call to action for us. It's a call to action for us to come together because this is a problem that will require everyone to solution. What we're going to do is we're going to run an accelerator And we're going to run the accelerator with an intent to get the best startups, thought leaders globally to come and look at verification. We're going to look at three aspects of verification. The ecological, we're going to look at the core benefits, and the last is financial. So ensuring that the money is going to the right place, being used for the right reasons, the trees or the nature-based solutions are providing the impact And of course, all the ancillaries and core benefits around it are also being realized. We want you all to come. We're going to run this accelerator. We'll choose a shortlist. The shortlist will be with us for six months. We are going to be providing tech support. We're going to be providing thought leadership. We'll have mentors, of course, from NUS. Uh, We're going to have our tech partners, Google, being involved. We're going to bring the best of the best to support you all with the view that in six months, the outputs will be showcased at the Ecosperity and show how we've been able to advance not only the thoughts, but also the actions in verification around nature-based solutions. So we want all of you all to jump in on the link. If it's you, we want you all to submit. If you know someone else, please forward to them and let's do this together. So with that, um, I hope you join us for the call to action. We hope to see a lot of people taking part of that. And thank you for everybody for tuning in. Thank you to my guests. I hope we convinced you that nature-based solutions are not just the right thing for the world, but actually also a really investable business case. Thank you.